think that people are going hungry now, the sorts of problems we're going to have over the next 20 years could be absolutely devastating. The problem of global food security is an enormous issue. The United Nations, for example, predict that over the next 20 years, there'll be an increase in demand of about 50% for food. Now, we haven't got any more land on this planet. We're already using as much as we possibly can. So we've got to find ways of getting 50% more food, but we're actually going to have to use less of an awful lot of the components that we use for growing food. I'm about to be the CEO of the Crops for the Future Research Centre, which will be constructed on the land behind me adjacent to the University of Nottingham Malaysia campus. Uh, my research interest has been in underutilised crops for many years, especially plants in the tropics. And of course, in that sense, Malaysia is a fantastic location because we have so many indigenous plants here. About 5% of the world's biodiversity is in the country of Malaysia alone. So to be the host partner of Crops for the Future and to be the host of the Crops for the Future Research Centre is actually a fantastic opportunity for us to start doing research on crops that come from this part of the world, as well as in many other parts of the developing tropics and even in temperate regions where we still have some indigenous plants. The work that we've been doing has been looking at a Nigerian stick meat called Sierra. In Nigeria, there's a problem not having an integral coal train. So both raw meat and the cooked meat product, which is sold on the street, very soon after cooking will go off because there's no refrigeration conditions under which to store them where you can't control it, then a lot of food gets thrown away, which, which really is a waste when you've already got a country with a very limited food supply, where people haven't got enough food, then you need to optimise the amount of usage of the food that there is. The aim of the research is to basically make plants more nutrient use efficient, so they can do more with less. Researchers are focused on the uh, top part of a plant to improve yields. What we're proposing is to actually look at the hidden half of plant biology, which is essentially the roots. And the roots really play a key role in terms of nutrient uptake, and they can make all the difference. In effect, we need to raise the yield of rice uh, more than other crops, uh, in the sense that it's essential for direct human nutrition. There's quite a few ways in which rice yield could be increased and we hope will be increased for responses to drought, uh, responses to high temperatures, including those uh, related to climate change. It's, it's, it becomes uh, difficult with the current methods that uh, either you have to produce a vaccine every single time when the virus changes or uh, trying to identify new antivirals. Um, so the, the focus which we uh, um, have in our research is to look at uh, modulating host immune response which uh, um, can, can be of uh, um, importance in the face of uh, a pandemic virus infection. What we're trying to do in our group here is very much addressing a very small problem of a much bigger jigsaw puzzle. But I feel that if we have enough pieces of a jigsaw puzzle to put together, collectively we could put in a substantial and significant input to address this very real problem of the future. Efficiency has got um, uh, two major objectives, if you like. Efficiency of producing pig meat. The second element of efficiency is nitrogen output. And they really are both part of the same objective because the more nitrogen the pig retains from its diet, the less comes out the other end. One of our programs is looking at uh, the efficiency of utilising different protein sources. Protein can come from soybean meal. We can also find protein from home-produced proteins like uh, peas and beans. There's also canola meal. If you look around the country in May, June, all these yellow fields, yellow flowers, that's canola and it's grown for its oil, and you remove the oil, you're left with a, a protein commodity. The, the trade in commodities, uh, raw agricultural commodities, so wheat, coffee, sugar, cocoa, those sorts of things, the way those flows actually move around the global economy, now that has implications for uh, consumption and production, but it also has implications for uh, the price of those commodities, and that's the most important thing from our point of view, is how do the prices of global commodities move? I think the interesting thing to emphasise here are perhaps the interconnections between um, a crisis within the climate, the, the global uh, warming, crisis in terms of food production and in the world economy as well. And those three crisis conditions, um, food, global warming and the economy, are really intersecting. 
Food sovereignty would of course also deal with issues of food security in the sense that it is important that people have access uh, to sufficient and nutritious uh, uh, food. But so food sovereignty would, on the other hand, also stress that people are in charge of their own destiny. We at Nottingham have had a long-standing tradition to work on agriculture and food sciences. I mean, I'm standing in a glass house which has actually got a whole variety of different types of wheat ancestors. So one of the things we're interested in doing is saying, OK, some of the ancestors of our crops were resistant to pests and pathogens. They were able to grow where there wasn't much water. How can we actually take that information and knowledge and actually put it back into the domesticated crops. But we're going to have to have people who are working with us and saying let's put aside some of the differences, some of the cultural differences, some of the political differences, some of the economic differences. That's where the solutions are going to come. And those are really difficult things to address because it means people from different disciplines have to talk the same language and work together. Mm -hmm.